Hey everybody, I'm Harris O'Malley from DrNerdLove.com. So, I listen to a lot of podcasts, especially dating advice podcasts. And if you're like me, and I know I am, that entails a lot of yelling back at the podcast like they can hear me. So, recently I'm catching up on my backlog of Dan Savage's Savage Lovecast. Incidentally, Dan, seriously. Call me. Podcast crossover. Let's make this happen. And there's a call that comes in about someone who is very excited to be going to hump Dan Savage's am touring amateur porn film festival. And this person is looking forward to being around all of these young, sexy, porn-watching, sex-positive people and wants to know what is the best way that he could go to some of these young, attractive, sex-positive, porn-watching people and let them know he's got a motel in the area and would they like to go check it out with him. Just... And this is where the yelling starts for me. No. First of all, do not do that. Do not do that. Second of all, no, that is not what sex positive means. It does not mean that you are down to hooking up with anyone who just happens to show up. But it also highlights a very real and recurring issue. That people don't understand how flirting works or how to use it the right way. Flirting isn't like negging, where you're trying to use backhanded compliments and subtle insults to lower somebody's social value to below yours so that now they're gonna crave your approval. And it's not about delivering compliment after compliment so that somebody thinks, oh my God, this person sees me in a way that nobody else does, they must be very special. And it's not even about being risque or being sexual or using sexual humor or trying to get someone to think about or talk about sex. There is no one way to flirt. Your style of flirting is going to be as varied and as unique as you are because it is going to be determined by things like your personality type, where you are, what you're comfortable with. No matter what your style of flirting is, there are some basics, some do's and don'ts, some best practices that are fundamental to every style of flirting. So this week I want to talk with you about the fundamentals of flirting, the best practices and do's and don'ts that form the key core components to successful flirting. And the first key to successful flirting is understanding why we flirt in the first place. Part of why people get confused or frustrated when they're learning how to flirt is that they get a little lost into the weeds as to the whole purpose of flirting. They understandably think that flirting is the ultimate attraction builder, that when you say or do the right things, people are going to be uncontrollably aroused and into you, and the clothes are gonna fly off, and now the party's gonna begin. And to be fair, they're not entirely wrong. But they're also not entirely right, either. Flirting is just a tool in your social toolbox. It's a very useful tool, and one that's incredibly versatile, but it's not the only one that you're going to use, and it's not the only thing that's going to be building attraction, because attraction isn't about any one thing. It is a holistic process. It is about you as a whole person, not just about what you say or what you do or whatever tricks or gimmicks you may try to use. The point of flirting is that you're building a connection with somebody and showing them that you're interested in them as a potential romantic or sexual partner. In fact, one of the reasons why so many people get stuck in the friend zone is that they never signal their interest in the first place. When you're flirting with someone, you're trying to build a rapport with them. Whether you're making them laugh, telling stories, being a little risque, or just asking the right questions, you're forging a connection with them and trying to get through that initial shield that we all put up when we meet someone new and get to know their true, authentic self. This, incidentally, is why negging is a bad idea overall. Not only is that whole social value, assortive mating stuff complete bullshit and no one actually does it, but it also ends up putting barriers between you and the person you're trying to connect with. You're making it harder for them to get to your true, authentic self rather than easier. Flirting, ultimately, is all about the connection and about answering the questions. Who are you? Why should I be interested in you? And why should you be interested in me? The second key component to successful flirting is understanding where and when 
and how to flirt. Like I said last time, understanding the social context of the situation is hugely important. It tells you what behaviors are expected and acceptable in any social situation. If your behavior clashes with the unwritten rules of your social situation, people are going to feel uncomfortable. Your actions are telling them that either you don't know or don't care what behavior is and isn't appropriate in that scenario, and that's going to set people's spidey sense of tingling. This is why it's okay to be a little bit more forward, a little more direct, and a little more open when you're flirting with someone at a singles bar or a club. These are places where the social contract says people come here because they are looking to meet other people, people they may be interested in dating people they may be interested in going home with, people they may be interested in having nasty club sex in the bathroom with. The same context doesn't exist at your local Whole Foods or Publix or Barnes & Noble. People don't go to the bookstore hoping to meet someone that they're going to bang. It could happen, but that's not the point of going to the bookstore, and so the rules are different. This is why trying to hook up with people at a film festival, to use a completely random example, is generally a bad idea. It doesn't matter whether it's at Fantastic Fest or South by Southwest, or at Hump for that matter, because Amateur Porn Festival doesn't trump Film Festival. That's not why people go there. Can it still happen? Sure, people hook up at festivals, at concerts, at conventions all the time, but it requires social calibration, emotional intelligence, and general experience to understand what is or isn't a good idea. Trying to hook up at the festival? Generally a bad idea. Now, the raucous after party at the nearby bar? That's an area where you're going to have more flexibility to flirt with people. The third core component to successful flirting is understanding the importance of the push-pull dynamic. When you're flirting, you don't want to just keep laying it on constantly. At best, you seem cheesy. At worst, you seem like someone who's going to try to bulldoze their way into somebody's pants. This is another really common mistake that people make when they're learning how to flirt. They think, not unreasonably, that if a little bit of flirting is good, then a lot of flirting is better. When you're joking and teasing somebody and they're laughing and it's going well, there's a natural assumption that you should just keep upping the ante. When you are complimenting somebody and they're receiving it and they're very pleased by it, then there is this, again, understandable thought that you should just keep telling them how amazing you think they are. But in practice, it's very easy to have too much of a good thing and end up blowing the entire connection. If you have that teasy, bantery style of flirting, it doesn't take very much before people think that everything's a joke to you and that they're not going to take you seriously. If you have that more straightforward, complimentary style of flirting, where you're telling someone that you think they're amazing, and you keep piling those compliments on, they're going to think that either you're extremely needy or you're desperate for their validation. And to be perfectly honest, neither of those is a great look on you. It helps to think of flirting like a pressure gauge. If you're constantly just piling it on and piling it on, you're going to overload the system and it's going to go very badly, messily and all over the place. Even if they're really into you, it's possible to go too far, too fast, leave people feeling uncomfortable, and blow the entire connection. This is why when you give a little with the flirt, with that pull, you also want to ease that tension with a push. So if you're telling someone how amazing you think they are, you may want to follow that up with a joking, disqualifying statement like, yeah, but then again, I'm also a horrible judge of character, so what do I know? Or you may want to be straightforward and say, oh, okay, that was a little bit too much, wasn't it? I'm just going to stop now. Or you may even just say, you know what? You're a little too much for me. I'm going to move over here. If you have that teasy, bantery style of flirting, you may instead drop the banter and just get real with them for a second. You are easing the pressure by taking away the jokes and letting them see the real you and build that real connection. Part of why using push-pull is important is because it keeps things interesting. You're doing the unexpected. You're zigging where they expected you to zag. You're creating a void where they expected something that was going to fill that space. As a result, they're left off guard, and now they're not sure what to expect. So they're going to be interested in seeing what comes next. There's going to be that moment of delicious antissa patient that draws them in and keeps their focus on you. Just as importantly, using a push-pull dynamic keeps you from going too far to the extreme. Somebody who has a more sexual style of flirting can go to creepy very easily. Someone who has a jokey style of flirting who is making someone laugh can go from someone who's just very funny to someone who is very clearly just workshopping the bit that they're going to use at their next open mic night. By using a push-pull dynamic to build interest and then release it, you keep interest alive without pushing too hard. Just as importantly, though, giving that release keeps things from getting too heavy. 
Dropping a serious compliment on someone can make things really intense, and not necessarily in a good way. Using a, using a release, using a push, takes some of the pressure out of the air, makes everybody feel a bit more relaxed. And also, because there's that sudden release, you're almost creating a sort of vacuum. And that is going to inspire the person that you're flirting with to want to fill up themselves. They're going to want to lean in and signal their interest and keep those good feelings going. And those good feelings and good times are important because the fourth key component of successful flirting is that flirting is supposed to be interactive and fun, not just a one-sided exercise. Teasing can be fun, but if all you're doing is joking and bantering, then you're never going to actually direct the conversation to where it needs to go, which is to say, bringing the two of you together. This is why you have to pay attention to the person that you're flirting with and not just thinking about the next thing you're going to say or do. Are they laughing and participating as much as you are, or are they getting very quiet? Are they looking relaxed and happy, or are they looking uncomfortable, or embarrassed, or checking their watch, or starting to shift their body away from you as though they're getting ready to walk away? Or maybe they're looking around like they're trying to make eye contact with somebody else. These are all signs that they're not that interested in you and that your flirting isn't going well. If this happens, the best thing to do is to just let the flirting go and just talk with them like a normal person. They're not that into you. That's okay. There will be other people who are. And then there will be times that you'll realize you've just completely misjudged things. They may not be interested. You may have said something wrong or you may have done something wrong and now they're feeling weird about it. This happens to everybody. Everybody makes mistakes, no matter how skilled they are, no matter how much game they have. But it happens the most when you're first learning. Why? Because you still haven't gotten the experience under your belt yet. And that's okay. Mistakes happen, but the thing to remember is that you can recover from them. And the best way to recover from a mistake is an apology. Don't make a big production out of it. Keep it short, simple, and sincere. Hey, I'm sorry. That came out wrong. That sounded really different in my head. Hey, sorry, I thought I caught a vibe there. I guess I was wrong. Above everything else, remember, flirting is supposed to be about the two of you having fun. If both of you aren't enjoying it, both of you aren't having a good time, you're doing it wrong. But if you can be the person who makes them laugh, the person who makes them feel good in your presence, the person that they enjoy spending time with because you are that fun, flirty guy, you're going to be the guy that they are going to want to go home with. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the latest video. Do you have a crazy story about the best or worst time you ever flirted with someone or the best or worst way that someone ever flirted with you? Be sure to share them in the comments below because I want to hear about it. If you've been enjoying the video, then be sure to uh, hit like and subscribe to make sure that you get more from me each week about love, sex, dating, even just being a better man. If you're really digging things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash drnerdlove. Even $1 a month is a huge help. Otherwise, books, I have them. You want to check them out. Link is down below. They're available in print or in ebook format. Meanwhile, follow me on Twitter at Dr. Nerdlove. Join the Facebook group at facebook.com slash Dr. Nerdlove. And I will be back with you next week with more about love, sex, and dating. Later.